how many IT guys and IS majors does it take to bring up a PowerPoint presentation? Apparently a lot. I don't know. <laughs> Apparently a lot. Um, I am very pleased to um, be asked to introduce uh, Siva Vadyanathan uh, as the Henderson lecturer today. I first met him in 2000. Um, I was a lecturer at Columbia Law School, and there was um, a presentation or a, a discussion group before that they had put together on that fascinating topic, anti-circumvention, and Siva was there. Um, he was young, brilliant, uh, extremely well-spoken, and I noticed when he stood up, very, very tall. <laughs> Uh, being short, I always notice those things. <laughs> in just a few years, uh, Siva has become one of the leading lights uh, in copyright law. Um, he's always standing up for <coughs> users' rights and uh, is so appreciated and loved for that reason. Um, he is a cultural historian uh, with PhD in American Studies from the University of Texas at Austin. <coughs> and he has served on the faculties of NYU, the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and now at the University of Virginia, where he is an associate professor of media studies and law. Um, I'm delighted that we attracted Siva and his wife to the southeast. Um, Siva's sister, Nani, is a student in the uh, School of Information and Library Science here, and uh, this fall she shared with me a video of uh, Siva's daughter uh, dancing in her diaper to her favorite uh, music, which happened to be the theme song uh, for the Colbert Report. And I thought, <laughs> this is probably going to be an amazing kid. So she was soaring with the eagle uh, at that time. Um, Siva's publication record is extremely um, uh, amazing for someone of his age uh, and, and years. Um, he has written uh, two books since 2001, edited a very large other one, and is working on yet another. And many articles in this time, too. I know because I read them all um, and had to reread them recently. Um, his work is thoughtful, insightful, and more than a little irreverent, I would say. Uh, Dr. Vadyanathan has also delivered many lectures and participated in countless roundtables, uh, presented at many conferences, etc. He is kind of becoming a rock star of copyright. I think, you know, you'll begin to know, sort of like Cher and Sting, we just know him as Siva. And that's all you have to say and people know who he is. I'm pleased to count him uh, as a friend and colleague uh, in the copyright, well, if not wars, at least serious skirmishes. I present to you Dr. Siva Vadyanathan. Um, so once again, I apologize for uh, the technical glitches. Uh, that's actually the worst I've ever had in terms of my <laughs> relationship with these machines, which I guess I'm lucky uh, because I've certainly been in your position for worse technological uh, malfunctions. So. Um, I'm talking about the Human Knowledge Project. Well, what is the Human Knowledge Project? It is something we could do. It's something we could choose to do. Uh, by we, I mean basically our species. I don't just mean librarians. I don't just mean academics. I don't just mean Americans. Uh, the Human Knowledge Project is something that uh, I would like to, over the course of these two lectures, uh, outline and um, generate some sort of discussion about. Uh, ultimately, what I'm Working into these two lectures uh, will come out as some sort of prose in English, in sort of linear form, uh, in a book that I'm writing uh, that's called The Googleization of Everything. Um, and The Googleization of Everything is uh, sort of an all-consuming uh, notion. It's certainly something that is not an alien concept to any of you. Uh, I'm sure most of you spend as much time interacting with that company and that interface as I do. Uh, and that very fact, that very phenomenon, is, I think, fascinating, exciting, and somewhat troubling. Uh, and I'm sure that you've had the same sort of misgivings that I have. Uh, I just decided to write a book on it, so that's why I'm here. And I'm really excited about being here. Uh, and I want to thank everyone involved uh, uh, with putting this together. Um, this is, uh, I've been uh, sort of uh, looking forward to the chance to address an audience uh, at this university for some time. Uh, the fact that my sister Nani uh, has been here uh, for three semesters now um, sort of brought 
this university a lot closer to, to, uh, to my consciousness and family. And, and now that we live a few hours away, it was even easier. So this was, uh, this was a great honor to be invited. Uh, and I'm, I'm really excited about this opportunity. I do hope that you can join me in a couple weeks uh, down the road in Durham uh, for the second half of this. Um, I'm going to leave the great climax of this story uh, out of it, so you'll have to join me. Um, all right. So the human knowledge, and of course, this thing's not working. <laughs> so the human knowledge project. <laughs> just have to act out the images. So, uh, and, and really, most of what I was going to present you is images. Uh, so the book, The Googleization of Everything, uh, what do I mean by Googleization? What do I mean by everything? Googleization is the process of having something, uh, I'm sorry, it's the phenomenon of having something processed by that company, uh, uh, interpreted for us, ranked for us, linked for us, presented, rendered for us by that company. So a lot of things are being Googleized. I think that there are three main categories of concern. One is the Googleization of knowledge. The Googleization of knowledge, which is the business of most of the folks in this audience. The notion that Google is playing an intimate role, a, a pretty powerful role, in determining what is important to us. What does that mean? What is that about? How, how can we get our minds around the notion that where something shows up on a Google rank has tremendous importance to our lives, has tremendous importance to commerce, right? If you're running a shoe store and you're on the eighth page of a Google search for size 13 through 18, uh, you're not going to make as much money as if you're on the first page of that, uh, of that search, set of search results. Um, if the set of search results is geared toward a particular uh, place in the world, because Google tends to know where you are when you're using it, uh, that's going to have a difference, uh, have an effect. If you're doing basic research on some subject, like say the Holocaust, it's going to matter quite a bit if a Holocaust denial site shows up a little bit too high in your searches, uh, especially if you're say an eighth grader and you don't necessarily know how to discriminate among sources of information. All of these things are feeding into this notion of the Googleization of knowledge. Second thing, the Googleization of communication. The company itself is playing a tremendous role in altering our communication environments. Not just because it is making a strong political stand for network neutrality, that's an important part. Not just because it's making a strong political and economic stand to uh, loosen up and open up our mobile phone platforms. That could be incredibly valuable. But also because in a number of important ways it's directly challenging major media industries and institutions. It's defense of YouTube. Uh, it's ways of using YouTube to negotiate with uh, content providing companies. Uh, it's uh, interaction with the publishing industry through Google Book Search. These are all examples of Google trying to set the rules, trying to establish new ways of behavior, new ways of interacting with major media industries, some of which are some, among the most powerful political institutions in this country. You, after all, don't want to mess with Time Warner and News Corporation unless there's a payoff. So what is the payoff? What do we get from it? What does Google get from it? How do those other major media corporations adjust their businesses to deal with the remarkable fast rise of this presence? And think about how quickly Google has come into our lives in less than 10 years. In less than 10 years, it has managed to infiltrate our daily lives in ways that I think rival any other company. I mean, maybe Walmart has come into our lives, but many of us can go years without going into a Walmart or at least we do our best to, right? But, but, but I really don't know of another company, uh, especially a technology company, that's had such a remarkable influence so quickly. Um, uh, I used to write back before it was an archaic way of expressing, expressing it and saying that, that uh, uh, Google has been around for less time than Brad Pitt and Jennifer Anderson were together. Um, but now that's, that's not a joke that works so well anymore. Um, so, uh, Okay, the third thing that Google is Googleizing is us, the Googleization of us. We are being uh, drawn into the Google system. Our 
personalities, identities, facts about our lives are being drawn into the Google system. Processed, again, rendered, again, often uh, analyzed in ways we can't really understand, even if we had the power to, we don't have the ability to. All of this becomes their private information, and we are given assurances that, uh, that Google will not abuse this power, this information. We're given assurances that Google will stand up to, for instance, the National Security Agency or the FBI if they come snooping around. We're given all sorts of assurances about security and, uh, and their, uh, their willingness to uh, cleanse our personal dossiers after 18 months. But nobody forces them to do any of this. There's no real enforcement of those sorts of standards and policies. And as you may have noticed, Google changes its privacy policies all the time, to the point where it really can't be called a privacy policy. It's just a, what we're going to do about you policy. Um, hey, this is what I was talking about. <laughs> Thank you again. All right, let's see if this works. No, OK, let's see if I can hit a button that doesn't make it freak out. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I already talked about that. <clears throat> so actually, I meant to make the Google Slides like a really short uh, part of this whole thing. Uh, this is Google's mission statement. It's official corporate mission statement. Um, this may ring familiar to you because it's probably your mission statement too, right? If you're a professional librarian or someone who works in the uh, information worlds in such a way, right? It's kind of what we're all after. It's kind of what we would all like to do. It's really stunning that a single commercial entity has taken this on as its mission, as its declared goal. Now, one thing you have to ask yourself as you read that mission is, does Google actually organize information? Or does it merely present it to you in a rank with a series of links? And is that the same thing? I'll leave it to you to figure that out. Now, Sergey Brin, one of the co-founders of Google, was asked one time, what would the perfect search engine be like? And he said it would be like the mind of God. And that's a pretty revealing statement, and I think somewhat troubling, if not blasphemous. Uh, and so I actually did a Google image search for the mind of God. And um, I'm pleased to report that even with safe search off, the mind of God is a lot less dirty than most of the things on the web. Uh, but you'll also notice that it's, uh, you probably can't see those images too well. Uh, most of those are what you might call representations of marginal religious belief and practice. Some are sort of uh, cult expressions. Some of them are on the edges of other mainstream religions. Uh, I think that's probably because, as with so much on the web, um, groups that are highly motivated and organized get favored over groups that are diffuse, even if well represented by many millions or billions. Um, so searching for the mind of God tends not to turn up anything from, say, the mainstream Presbyterian church. Uh, but Falun Gong seems well so if Google has a theology behind it, this is certainly one of the core tenets of Google, one of the core features of Google, that it is everywhere, that it matters in ways we could never have predicted, uh, that it shows up all sorts of places in popular culture, in common speech, etc., uh, in our pockets, on our phones, uh, in all sorts of ways. It's of course a remarkably rich and powerful company although like all American companies, not quite as rich as it was two weeks ago. Um, but I, you know, and you know, this always happens to me. Uh, last time I wrote a book, I got a contract based on this promise I was gonna write the book about Napster, and before I could finish the book, the company basically disappeared. Uh, and so I was stuck having to sort of refashion it in a way that made sense and made it relevant. And uh, as soon as I signed a contract to write a book about Google, its stock price dropped. And my wife was teasing me that, oh my gosh, Google's going to go out of business before you. But I, I'm pretty sure it's not. I'm pretty sure it's not. All right. And of course, Google seems omniscient. Google seems to be able to track us in all sorts of important ways. And as I said before, we can't really be sure how this information is being used. And of course, Google likes to think of itself and declare itself on the good side of things. Its reaction to uh, the latest venture by Microsoft to acquire Yahoo uh, sort of fill, fits into this. Uh, the the uh, immediate response by Google involved a plea for openness and uh, 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 raising suspicions that Microsoft, as we all know all too well, 
uh, is the bad guy in this battle. All right, so what does all this have to do? By the way, here's the Holocaust example that I was going to bring up. If you actually do Google the phrase truth about the Holocaust, um, you will get a whole lot of things full of untruth about the Holocaust. Um, these are, every one of these is the Holocaust now. Now, there's good reason for that. You shouldn't actually be asking, okay, I want to find out the truth about the Holocaust by typing in that, those words. People who use that phrase tend to um, have a lot of time on their hands and uh, like to link to Holocaust denial sites. So you're going to get uh, an odd mixture. But I just wanted to bring that up as one of the weird twists to organizing our knowledge this way. So what does this have to do with the Universal Library? Well, Google, as you know, is participating in a pretty massive project of scanning in many millions of books from at least 25 major university libraries in the United States and several of them in Europe. And they've actually created a number of partnerships with other libraries around the world to the point where I can't even keep track. Uh, every week they have new partners. Um, my own university has recently uh, become part of this group as well. Um, and, uh, and so there's a lot of buzz about it, a lot of excitement about it. Um, much of this is justified. Uh, there seems to be uh, a real sense that we can, we can, with the help of Google, um, create a collection of digitized texts that is full text searchable, discoverable, linkable, rankable, and we can find out how to actually get these books through this system. You know, the interface, which you're probably familiar with, has all kinds of links for how to purchase these books and even how to find them in libraries near you. Um, there are lots of different ways that this service can work. And this is, of course, uh, presented as part of a many centuries long effort to actually distribute the best of our knowledge to as many human beings as possible. So this is part of the sort of continuing myth of the Library of Alexandria, which as you probably know, it wasn't all that great a library. Um, it, there just wasn't a whole lot else going on in the world at the time, library-wise. Uh, and, uh, and you probably might not know just how long it actually lasted. Um, for a number of centuries, it just didn't really last in its pristine form for a long time because it burned several times. And a bunch of different invaders uh, uh, took it down uh, in a different ways. Uh, but nonetheless, when we flash back on the Library of, of Alexandria, we like to think about the lost potential of having this grand library that seemed to capture all of the great things about, uh, about human knowledge at the time. Uh, the, the goal of creating encyclopedias, which came out of uh, first the Renaissance and later hit full stride in the European Enlightenment, uh, it was based on the same notion, that you can at least distill the best of the world's knowledge and keep updating it through these volumes uh, that would be portable and easily accessible and easily searchable, in a sense. <coughs> Right? All of the virtues that we attach to the web now, at least the web interpreted through a good search engine, uh, was, was part of the ways that encyclopedias were sold, not door to door like we're so used to seeing in a cliche, but sold as a project, as a project to be funded, to be written, to be edited, to be distributed, to be printed. Um, and so the encyclopedia project of the Enlightenment was very much part of this notion. Uh, as our founders, uh, chiefly Jefferson and Madison, uh, invested their own books as well as their efforts in the Library of Congress, they did so with this notion of having grand national libraries uh, potentially down the road, um, starting with the Library of Congress. And there was this pretension to universality. It would at least encompass all of the best works published in this, uh, in this country, if not this continent. Uh, and of course, uh, you're probably familiar with uh, Borges' story, The Library of Babel, a dystopian notion of a of a, of a library so vast, so universal, that it becomes pretty much unusable. Uh, uh, the Everett Bush, uh, his article, as we may think, from 1945, uh, laid out the notion of having records linked to each other, speak to each other, interact with each other. Um, and it certainly served as a template for the hyperlinked uh, uh, in, uh, interfaces we use now. Um, jump a couple of decades closer and we get more overt declarations that we are close to having a sense of a universal library. Um, you may remember in the summer of 2006, Kevin Kelly, who is one of the founding editors of Wired Magazine, wrote uh, a, a pretty strong celebration 
of what Google was doing with its library scanning project, but of course expressed in the most sort of over-the-top terms of how this was going to revolutionize human knowledge, democratize human potential, globalize uh, knowledge in a way that would um, uh, pave over all of these uh, tremendous differences in wealth, that we, at least wealth of information that we have in the world. And then more recently, Dave Weinberger has come through with a really provocative book uh, that hopes to undermine the century-long tradition of, of, of cataloging and, 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 uh, and celebrates this uh, democratic process of tagging as a uh, much more efficient and effective way of categorizing information. Um, of course, a very controversial position, uh, one that seems to sort of gloss over all of the tremendous um, uh, progress we've made in terms of uh, cataloging over the last few decades and takes as its um, as its great uh, um, uh, bogeyman, uh, Melville Dewey, an easy target, certainly. Uh, so this, this notion of having a universal library in, in, encompasses a number of features. First of all, there's a very populist democratic notion that we elites who are attached to universities like this uh, should not be the only ones with cheap and easy and quick access to the best knowledge in the world. Hard to disagree with that. Secondly, uh, that the, the information itself should be malleable, should be usable, should be digestible, hackable, should be mixable and mashable by people who want to make new things. That's a pretty good statement. It certainly fits in with what a lot of uh, those of us in this room and in this profession believe, too, because it's kind of what we do. Um, uh, but also that it should eliminate hierarchies or, or e evade hierarchies. Evade hierarchies of expertise. And this is part of the rhetoric of universal libraries that has come through in recent decades. It's not quite what dominated, in fact, it was pretty absent from earlier century discussions of universal libraries. Uh, the encyclopedists of the, of the 18th century were not so interested in destroying their own status as, as the literary elite. Uh, but certainly now, that's part of the agenda, it seems. That's certainly an element of how Kelly and Weinberger described their projects. All right, so what are these four errors? Four errors is what I, what I advertised to you, what I, what I promised to you when you came here. Right? Four conceptual errors as we lurch toward uh, what we might think of as a universal digital library. By the way, it is really a lurch. Right? This is how we've done it. We've moved from an ad hoc notion from ad hocism about creating digital libraries that have widespread access to a Googleocracy, or at least a centralization. It's not really a monopoly because there are a number of rather large-scale projects uh, involved in massive digitization projects, uh, but we have essentially moved beyond the ad hoc model, which, as you know, dominated uh, much of the digitization world for uh, more than a decade uh, before the last few years where individual libraries or maybe even consortia would get together and uh, produce digital collections and try to figure out how to, uh, how to create good metadata for it and how to, how to host it and, and how to distribute it and what the limitations should be and all those good things were, were sort of fought through atomistically around the world. Um, and now we've moved into almost a sense of standardization, at least with uh, the Open Content Alliance and Google being the leader players in that process of standardization. We also have some other players in this as well, including uh, the French national libraries, uh, which are involved in their own project. And there are a number of other places around the world where uh, state-funded institutions are trying to do this. So as we move to this, what seems to be, <coughs> excuse me, what seems to be uh, an effort to uh, create a digital library, a virtual library, we forget that a collection is not a library. The collection of li collections and libraries are not the same thing. Libraries need collections, but they are not collections. Libraries do many things for us, and many things, and we do many things in and with libraries. Uh, and, and too often, the rhetoric of universal digital libraries mistaken, mistakenly conflates the collection and the library, and ignores, for instance, the value of human guidance. Right? This notion that we can actually create a very powerful algorithm that will take us where we need to go, and we need not bother dealing with other human beings who might miss something, or might have biases, or might actually have expertise that could shorten the trip. Uh, instead, we wish for the clean, 
and clear linking and ranking. We wish for the illusion of precision, whether it's humane or not. And so one of my goals in this project is to get people to understand that interacting with both human beings and real space, and I'm not just talking about patron to librarian, but actually patron to patron, is an important part of the value of libraries. And I think this is an urgent argument to make for a number of reasons. One, uh, you may have noticed if you've tapped into some discussions around universities in the United States now, every time a college or university tries to design a new library, uh, there's always somebody on the Board of Trustees who comes through and says, library? What do you need a library for? You have the internet. And I'm not making that up. People say it all the time. Trustees say it all the time to uh, university presidents, to provosts, to directors of libraries, and it's maddening. And it's largely because a lot of them are lawyers and a lot of law firms got rid of their law libraries, so they think everybody can, right? Um, uh, because for that very narrow project of legal research, they're able to cut costs especially and certainly uh, uh, energize their, uh, their legal research through this move to digital collections. But again, a collection is not a library. It might do the job for a law firm just fine. It doesn't do the job. Um, uh, an 18-year-old who needs some sort of guidance and interaction and inspiration. Uh, by the way, that uh, picture up here is the Brooklyn Public Library, which I think is, uh, is one of those places everyone should visit uh, when going to New York, uh, because it will really inspire you about the role of libraries in people's lives. Any hour that it is open, the tables are filled with children from 6 to 16 years old. And, uh, and most of them are sitting there with parents going through homework. Uh, some of them are sitting in groups doing school projects. It is, uh, it's truly uh, an energizing and inspirational place. If you have doubts about the future of American public education, uh, a lot of that can be allayed by watching uh, kids work at the Brooklyn Public Library. It's, it's, it's really inspirational. Now, this conflation of libraries and collections is dangerous for a couple reasons. One, for a number of centuries, and just about, until very recently, the main challenge of a library was to manage scarcity, to deal with limitations on space, limitations on budgets, limitations on availability of materials, limitations on the fact that some materials are rare and special and can only be accessed in certain places. So to serve patron needs, of course, it was all about managing scarcity. So knowing that, understanding that, it's too simple to say that the way to solve all the problems that libraries deal with is to move toward a situation of abundance. That's actually a little bit too clear cut. The problems facing libraries aren't necessarily that they manage scarcity well, that's actually its strength. Uh, but it's, it's important to remember that that process of managing scarcity applies very well to the world of abundant information as well, because it is about making choices. It is about making choices based on quality and not just quantity. Now, of course, the web is, uh, is nothing if not abundant, and companies like Google are managers of abundance. That is what Google does. Google hides things. It's hard to think of Google, we think of Google delivering things to us. Actually, Google is a huge filter. It masks all the things we don't necessarily want to see. It puts the stuff it thinks we don't need or don't want very low maybe page 25, maybe not on the, on, the, on the list at all, right? So what does a search engine do? It does the following things. It copies, it indexes, it filters, it ranks, it links, it tags. All great, it, it works remarkably well for a set of documents that is growing at an amazing rate, a set of documents that's sometimes disappearing at an amazing rate, a, an unstable, set of documents, an unstable collection. Not only an unstable collection, a linked collection, right? An actual network of texts. A search engine is perfect for that. Everything is geared to managing abundance. It's again, I think, a conceptual mistake, a mistake to think that you can just move a, a, a huge collection, a huge archive into servers and accomplish what a library actually does. You, to do that, you have to actually ignore the real values that libraries present to our lives. The second error is conflating quantity and quality. Right? This notion that if some is good, more is better. 
this idea that it's all about the size of the index. And by the way, in the, uh, not so long ago, when Google was the new player in the search engine world, um, you may remember this, it was a brief period of time when the competing search engines at the time, Yahoo and Excite, would boast of the number of pages in their index. That was a major marker of quality. Right? The race to search engine domination was actually sort of based on how well their spiders crawled. Right? And that was, that was a weird way to sell uh, a search engine service, but it was kind of effective at the time because the web was clearly much more vast than any of these companies had been able to grasp at the moment. So the web was expanding much faster than they could crawl the, the web. Uh, and so boasting of, uh, of processor speed and number of servers and, and spider activity was really important. So the number of pages in the index became a marker of quality. And they never really got beyond that notion. That it's all about more, more, more. That if we can scan in millions of books, we can provide a service worth millions of books. Just last week, the University of Michigan bragged that its one millionth book had been scanned into the Google uh, book search collection. Um, whether or not we can actually get to these million books is another question. The terms under which we can get access to these million books, again, another question. All sorts of questions unanswered in this relationship, but man, they got to a million fast. Congratulations. All right. Well, Kevin Kelly has this, suffers from the same issue. Right? He has this notion that the first step to a universal sense of knowledge, to transforming the human condition, is to scan everything in in such a way that it becomes what he calls a liquid fabric, a liquid fabric of knowledge. And I apologize for putting huge body of text up there, but he, he's the master of run-on So, uh, And I wanted to get all four of these four things that he says are going to happen. Um, the first claim is pretty interesting, that when you create as large a uh, collection as possible, the long tail get, comes into play. When you create a many million book index, he wants you to believe, the small stuff, the stuff you may have ignored, <coughs> is more likely to find itself in your field of vision. Right? You're more likely to find it, is how I should express it. Um, that is a pretty dubious claim. Because after all, if you want to hide a tree, where better than a forest? Uh, the size of the collection actually inhibits the discovery of the marginal. It is the selection of the marginal, not something spontaneous or accidental that happens. Right? And long tails don't happen just because the collection is big. Long tails happen because human beings make choices. Um, but Kevin Kelly, the way he explains what's happening here is all very much about processes and energies and technologies that work above and beyond any human will. Right? Human decision is absent. If you notice how he writes, things will happen. Things must happen. Things definitely will happen. Uh, second, the Universal Library will, will, again, will deepen our grasp of history. Because all these documents will be available. That's actually a pretty good claim, actually. Having primary documents available in digital form uh, in full digital form, that's, that's actually a pretty good argument for, for this project uh, done this way. Now again, there are lots of ways to do it well as opposed to poorly. Thirdly, there's a new sense of authority. I have no idea what he means by that. <laughs> uh, I don't know what a full, new sense of authority means. But, and finally, we're going to have better search function. Why? Because we're going to have a new culture of participation and interaction. Well, I would respond to him that we've always had cultures of interaction and participation. That is what, after all, what it means to be human and to be social and to be cultural. It is how we deal with each other. And we do that every day, right? We, are, we live through quotation mixes, mashups, uh, references, allusions, uh, quoting what happened on TV the night before. Um, that is culture. It's not a new culture of interaction and participation. The real question is, can we make our structures, our regulatory structures and systems uh, facilitate that easier? Now, the third error, one that Kelly is very <coughs> uh, guilty of, is succumbing to technological determination. I'm sorry, sermons. Uh, to this rather simplistic view of how human history moves. 
right? A simplistic view of how human history moves, technolog technological determinism, goes something like this. Really smart guy in New Jersey named Thomas Edison invents a light bulb and click the 20th century, right? That's not actually how it works. Every new technology, every new interaction is a part of a process, part of a social and cultural and often political and military process where there are lots of inputs and lots of outputs. And some technologies thrive and some are forgotten and some are revived later uh, and some make no difference whatsoever. But there is no clear linear process through which better and better inventions displace less effective inventions. Part of the rhetoric of technological determinism is this notion that there is nothing we can do about it. There is nothing we can do about it. By the way, this is an M.C. Escher work called Predestination, inspired by John Calvin. Uh, and it is exactly what I'm arguing against. We are not inevitably moving toward any state of technological interaction. We make choices. We make choices as consumers choices as inventors and developers. Sometimes it doesn't feel like we make choices, right? I don't know when I actually decided that I really, really needed a phone in my pocket at all times. Um, I did make that decision. I can't be absolved of that responsibility. But, it, you know, it just sort of came into my life. But is that bad faith to say that? I think it is. I did choose. I did choose at a moment that I wanted this to be part of my life. I certainly have the option to choose not to have that as part of my life. We must recognize that nothing is inevitable, that we actually do control uh, our technological worlds. We do control how we are going to interact with other people. Uh, some trends seem irresistible. Nonetheless, we do have a no vote. So here's more Kelly text. In the new world of books, every bit informs another every page reads all the other pages. This should sound very familiar. It's like information wants to be free. No, humans want to be free. Humans want to use information to be free. Every bit informs another. No, humans inform bits. Every page reads all other pages. No, humans read other pages. Humans make decisions. Decisions don't get made for us by these interactions. Now, John Updike, who wrote a response to Kevin Kelly's essay, a couple weeks after Kevin Kelly's cover story in the New York Times Magazine ran, Updike gave a talk at a book conference. And this, the, the text of his talk um, was reprinted on the back page essay of the New York Times Book Review in the summer of 06. And Updike lamented what he saw as Kelly's vision destroying the wonderful life that he had as a young person wandering the streets of Greenwich Village in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, because after all, it was a life filled with wonderful bookstores and people who could point him in the directions of these great works and great. And it's, it's full of nostalgia, but one thing that Updike missed, did not address, is the fact that Kelly actually has a pretty powerful argument on his side, which is the desire to democratize information, the desire to link those who have no access to the best information in the world to good information. Kelly has that going for him, he makes a bit too much of it. Updike ignores that deep concern altogether because, after all, you know, maybe it was our fault for not growing up on the streets of Greenwich Village and having access to great bookstores. Um, but you'll notice also Updike does not deflate, does not puncture Kelly's sense of technological determinism. Updike's entire essay laments what he sees as the inevitable fall of books, as the inevitable destruction of print culture. <clears throat> Again, nothing is inevitable, and Mr. Updike is actually evidence in everything else he does that print culture is alive and well. The fourth error, and of course Kelly is chiefly uh, uh, responsible for committing all of these errors in, in, in his writing about this, the fourth error is hubris. Is this idea that we can do this, what we thought was a really expensive project, right? Scan them, millions, scan millions of books into servers, um, create full text search offer them in some form, with some level of access, and boom, the world is a better place. Let me give you examples of people talking like that. Here's my buddy Larry Lessig, uh, who agrees, agrees with me about 99% of the things in the world. On this thing we differ, 
Um, he is quite hyperbolic about the potential for Google's book search to radically change and improve the world. Um, he starts out by saying it's going to radically improve a country, saying that we're going to actually realize Jefferson's dream of national libraries. Kelly, of course, once again invokes Alexandria in his vision of what's going to happen. Um, and that, of course, the world will be much better. By the way, that picture here is the new library at Alexandria, uh, which is really no more useful to most of the world than the old library. <laughs> now, here's a fifth error. It's not one that I wanted to include in our, my original outline for what I was going to present here today, but it's one that's been bugging me because it's been a conversation I've been involved with uh, on a number of fronts online. Uh, and that is this notion, uh, and you see this quote from... Paul Courant. Paul Courant's a wonderful and brilliant man. He's a, an economist, a mathematician. He, uh, he was the provost of the University of Michigan for a long time. While he was provost of Michigan, uh, he initiated the, the Google uh, book scanning deal. Uh, and now he's director of libraries. Um, he is in a hurry. He and I differ on this major point. He's in a hurry to get this done. I would rather do it slowly, carefully, and right. And the reason he's in a hurry, he says, is that kids today won't read books. He doesn't actually say it quite so bluntly, but this is what he does say. We have a generation of students who will not find valuable scholarly works unless they can find them electronically. Um, I spent a lot of time trying to get students to read electronic works, and it's not always that successful. I don't think we can generalize quite so clearly about uh, young people, even young people at elite universities, in my classes, I have such a range of skills and interests in using electronic materials. Um, I have a frightening level of allergy in my classes to using electronic materials. Um, some students are deeply afraid of using electronic materials. Um, many of my students have never been on Facebook. Many of my students don't have mobile phones. It's amazing as it is to think, right? We assume that they all do. They don't all. Many of my students are the first generation to go to college. Not as many as we would probably like at a, a university like Virginia. Many of my students come from other countries. And their interaction with digital technologies uh, pretty much comes down to creating, forging links with their families many miles away, but don't necessarily involve mastering HTML or understanding how RSS works. There's such a wide range of expertise and interest among young people in major universities today, but think about how I qualified that. Young people in major universities. The number of young people in major four-year universities in this country is about 25% of young people in this country. Right? Only about one in four actually goes to a four-year university, and a smaller fraction than that actually get degrees from four-year universities. So anytime we're talking about this born digital generation, and we're trying to satisfy the presumed needs of a group of people, as Paul Courant is, uh, we have to remember we are talking about elites once again. We're generally talking about ethnic elites and uh, wealth elites. We're certainly talking about elites in terms of information literacy. And we are pretending that they all have and come from the same level of skills. That's one problem. The second problem is that when we talk about the born digital generation, we tend not to get beyond the United States. We tend not to say, hey, what do kids in Mexico deal with? What do kids in South Africa deal with? What do they need? We tend not to ask that, even though there are a whole lot more kids in Mexico than there are in the United States right now. So if we're actually worried about empowering young people, then we have to pay attention to where the young people are. <clears throat> Thirdly, we have to remember, and this is sort of the hardest point to grasp, that in an abstract sociological sense, there is no such thing as a generation. Right? Often when we write or talk about generations, we pick arbitrary years and we say, oh, generation fill in the blank started this year and ended this year, and you generally pick whatever years make your case. And you <laughs> declare some historical event that somehow unifies everyone of that particular generation, even if it is as mundane and trivial as Fonzie jumping the shark. <laughs> so, so in fact, there is no such thing as a generation. In fact, even major historical events like World War II affected the young people at the time in so many different ways, because a whole lot of them died 
and a whole lot of them lost people who died, and a whole lot of them did what they could in factories. And so the diversity of, inf of influence, the diversity of effect, is so broad that saying that one particular event affected everybody between 18 and 25 in the same way is frankly wrong. Right? So I've been involved in this, uh, in this sort of back and forth about this notion, uh, trying to deflate the idea that generations actually exist. Um, because it's too easy to talk about them. Uh, and not a day goes by that you don't see a newspaper article about the born digital generation. Because after all, we're told to believe that young people no longer care about privacy. After, because their Facebook pages are filled with pictures of them drunk or in various states of disrobing. But in fact, we know that not to be true. We know that young people care very much about controlling their own information in the right context. That they have, and they seek contextual mastery over their senses of self and presentation. Uh, and so this is sort of part of, the reason it's linked to this is we should not make major policy decisions based on myth, based on, uh, uh, on illusion, based on essentially sociological prejudice that favors a very small class of technologically elite young people at major universities. So there is a better way. There is a better way. There is a way to satisfy our basic needs as human beings toward information. There is a way to figure out how to link up 12-year-olds in South Africa to the great knowledge of the world. So maybe there's a 12-year-old in South Africa who, 20 years from now, can figure out a cure for malaria because she had access to the right information at an early age. That's possible. Wouldn't it be great to empower every 12-year-old around the world to have that much potential, have as much potential as my daughter has, to make a difference in the world, right? That should be our goal. Our goal should not be to satisfy the presumed market demands of students who are writing $40,000 checks to go to college. That should not be our goal. Our goal should not be to satisfy the pressures of legislators who don't want to build more buildings to house books. That's not a good enough reason to do this. Our goal should certainly not be to expand the collections of Google so that we each spend more hours per day in the Google universe. That should not be our goal. Our goal should be to say, what can we do to level the opportunities around the world? And what role does information and information technology play in that? It probably doesn't play a simple, flat, and easy role. You can't give a kid a $200 laptop and expect that kid to become anything familiar to you. But you can possibly figure out what incremental technological and information interventions can make that kid's life better. That requires a tremendous amount of work. We actually have to listen to people who live in those conditions. We actually have to tailor our interventions for specific situations on the ground. So that our efforts to provide information technology and information in Somalia will be different than Nigeria, will be different than South Africa, will be different than Indonesia. And that's okay. But to get to that, we actually have to have a global conversation about what this collection will mean and how it will be presented. Will it be English mostly, English first, English only? Will the search engines only operate in English? What will be the terms of access? Will they be short snippets of text with links to a library that a kid in Indonesia can't get to? Will there be links to Amazon to a book a kid in Indonesia can't afford? Is that good enough? Is it a good start? It might be. We have to declare what our principles are as we imagine building this project, what I call the Human Knowledge Project. And we have to dare to demand that we unify and solidify our resources behind such a project. Because if we actually believe that increasing access to knowledge, increasing access to books, information, culture, makes us better. If we know that to be true in our hearts, we have a responsibility to make sure that we're not just making the rich richer and the poor poorer. Thanks very much.
two. Questions, issues, complaints, advice on how to deal with computers better? <laughs> I have a question. Yes. So you have this ideal of a better way. How would you uh, interface that with the, for good or ill, market truth that is the world? Great. Yes. Uh, you'll have to come to Duke to hear the answer. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, no, but I'll tell, I mean, this, I'll give away a bit of what I'm going to talk about at Duke. You do it by convincing the right people and a large enough group of people that it is essential. And this has been done before and very recently. The reason that this two-part talk is called the Human Knowledge Project is it's inspired by the Human Genome Project. The Human Genome Project started as a, uh, an ad hoc process of annotating, establishing and annotating the human genome. It was done at a variety of universities around the world. Uh, at some point in the 1980s, the National Institutes for Health uh, got enough appropriation to coordinate the U.S. part of that effort. But the other parts of the effort to annotate the human genome were going on chiefly in France and Japan. Uh, and all of these processes, these, at least these three projects, then started competing to get it done faster. But there was this notion that it would be done over 40 years, right? There was, there was this sense that there was no urgency to it, but they would devote enough resources to keep it going. So no one really paid attention to the Human Genome Project until a guy named Craig Venter quit the Human Genome Project and started his own company called Solera. Solera, stop me if this sounds familiar, was a highly funded private uh, project to produce and distribute a tremendous amount of highly specialized information very fast to a large number of people for profit, right? And it was incredibly effective. He had developed a technique of, uh, of determining the elements of the genome called shotgunning, and he had, and this technique was was pretty valuable. He licensed the technique; he didn't have the exclusive right to it, fortunately. Um, so he said, "Forget the publicly funded projects that were sort of disparate and disconnected and poorly organized and poorly funded. Um, I'm going to do this faster, better, and then I'm going to be able to achieve patent protection for each element of the genome, whether it actually does anything or not." and then license this information to pharmaceutical companies and make incredible amounts of money. That was his goal. Well, this notion of privatizing our own genetic information was so morally offensive that it wasn't hard for uh, the United States project to coordinate with the French project and the Japanese project and ultimately some other researchers in the United Kingdom to do a coordinated global, universal, free, and open system that would actually do it better than Solera was and open up the information, because after all, this was all publicly funded, uh, to researchers at all levels. Uh, and so a race ensued throughout the 90s. Uh, in the last few days of the Clinton administration, um, both projects published their initial results in, in the biggest journals in the field, one in nature and one in science, and they basically declared a tie. Uh, and that inspiration, this notion that there was deep concern about the privatization of this, uh, of this amazing amount of knowledge and the potential for it changing our lives and our planet, made it imperative. Scientists around the world said this cannot be owned by any particular country, and it certainly cannot be owned by any particular company within a particular country. It's too important to be left to a private company. And I have the same concerns about our current situation. The wealth of knowledge that we've compiled through these centuries is too valuable to be left to one or maybe two companies. I think that we have a responsibility to make sure that it's done right, that it's done in an egalitarian and open fashion. And, and so what I'm suggesting is actually directly inspired by the Human Genome Project, which has been immensely successful uh, in its efforts. And, and it wasn't a hard case to make, mostly because nobody really liked Venter. That was a big difference in these two problems, right? Nobody really liked Venter. But everyone loves Google, so that makes it a lot harder on me. Um, so, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's easy to do. It doesn't mean that I'm going to convince anybody who matters that this is worth doing. Uh, but I'm certainly uh, going to suggest it and write about it and talk about it and see what flies. I think we missed a great opportunity when, when all of these digitization projects were 
um, were atomized, were dis, disaggregated. And we missed an opportunity to look at using uh, the power of partnership in Sortia, especially across borders, uh, to create a, a better system. In other words, there was a vacuum. It was, it was like, I don't know what the word is, but the opposite of a market fit. It was a public sector failure. I mean, the public sector didn't step up to create this sort of service, and so the private sector, a weird private sector actor, which behaves unlike any other private sector actor, stepped into the void, something we're not used to seeing, um, and did so in a way that doesn't obviously present a market opportunity. I mean, Google's use of this material isn't clearly a winner for them. Um, it kind of makes sense with their project of sort of keeping your eyeballs in the Google universe as long as possible, which is why the archive's not really, uh, the collection's not really available to any other search engine. Uh, there's that level of exclusivity, but you know, it's not like they're selling this stuff. They're not even getting a cut from clicking on the Amazon link. I mean, they're that far removed from the marketing of books. It's a pretty stunning uh, move, and one that's really hard to crack immediately. Um, so no, I mean, I'm not naive enough to think that, uh, that anything I say today is gonna change the mind of one library director who signed up with Google, or that what I've said today is going to inspire a grand global movement, uh, but I, I'm hopeful that it, it at least challenges how we comfortably think about how we're going in this project. So we might be able to avoid pitfalls along the way. Yes. So if, there was a, if there's been a public sector failure here and Google is clearly pretty well insulated from um, any sort of market fluctuations at this point, they're in a pretty confident position. Um, I'm hoping, yeah. But what is, the, uh, what is the proper method for clients for accountability for trying mm. to dialogue? That's going to be have to be the last chapter of my book. Oh, am I wrong? And what I find to the more recent cohorts, and overall numbers for the class of 92 days. Yeah, but post-secondary is much bigger than four-year degree granting, which is what I'm saying. Oh, they enrolled? Wow. Yes. That's a lot Right, people who started 15. So that makes it 25% actually graduate. so elite than if we actually achieve that, right? So, um, well, we can't assume much about what they actually do in college or what they do after college based on those numbers. Uh, working with information, certainly, but that's, that's indisputable. The information management is a bigger part of our economy every day. That's not the same thing as to say that there is a different mindset or a different sense of imagination uh, or uh, a, a, a basic uh, market or consumer demand that we have to satisfy with our policies. Um, but it's certainly not, it, it, I'm not here to argue that information technology is irrelevant to either schooling or professions or anything else in American life. It's, uh, it's certainly omnipresent, but it's not universal, and that's the important distinction. Yes? So all the scanning, Google is only one of several collaborative scanning projects out there. It's uh, exact the uh, Open Content Alliance and the Open Library Project. Beside that, yeah. are really aimed at being the open genome section of this. And uh, Brewster does have international ambitions, and there are scanners 
internationally with this. So do you want to speak to the plus minus? Yeah, well, that was he was going to be the hero of my Duke part of this talk, right? Exactly. And that's, I mean, that is the key. Now, one of the things about that, Brewster's efforts and the Open Kind of Alliance efforts here are wonderful and they're designed uh, pretty ideally, and I'm, I'm a huge fan of it. They're very much underfunded, right? That is what that project, what that project needs is public funding. And I think it's worth doing. Um, and, and for a variety of reasons, and I think it would, it would be so much more successful if we actually were able to generate the will to accomplish that. Um, so that's, in one sense, that's the short answer to that. But yes, the Open Content Alliance serves as, as at least the gestational uh, model for it. So one follow-up to that is the University of North Carolina Libraries and the School of Information Library Science are members of both those organizations. Is Virginia and is Duke? Uh, I have no idea what Stoop is doing. Virginia is not. Virginia is working only with Just Google. Point that out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, we're also we're also like one in six in the ACC in basketball this year. There's a lot I have to answer for. Uh, yeah. Uh, but you know, hey, they're they're still paying. Just rewarding. If you guys join the Continental Alliance, you'll move up in the ACC. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. Yes, in the back Yes. I have a question. You're comparing the Google um, uh, uh, open service to uh, the private version of the Juno project. The private version of the Juno project contains rights for patents and therefore permit later researchers from right. finding those same genes independently and making them available to the public. Whereas, and my understanding of the Google project is unless they're uh, forcing the libraries to only allow the works to be scanned by Google, some later comer or free project can come along and scan Michigan or Virginia. You're absolutely right. There isn't an exclusive notion. There isn't an exclusive uh, contract uh, provision, an exclusivity provision in the contracts between these libraries and Google, which is, uh, you know, one of the nice things about Google. Google is not Solera, right? It's not Craig Venter's efforts. Um, it's not so craven. And therefore, it makes it a lot harder to rally concern or, or a countervailing strategy. It doesn't make it impossible. It's, uh, the, the, the analogy is imprecise uh, from every angle. Um, to be polite, to you know, generous to my own argument, it's imprecise. It's probably not not even close to precise. Um, but uh, having a lack of exclusivity in the contract de jure does not mean that there is uh, uh, not de facto exclusivity. Because once a university has agreed to put its books on carts and take them over to the little room where the Google gnomes then come out of the screen and take the books in. Once you're actually involved in that process, you have no incentive to hook up with the Open Content Alliance. Why do it? There has to be a clear reason to put your collection and your staff through that again. Um, and so, I mean, it's, it's understandable that universities are picking one or the other and not both. Uh, and so you don't have to actually build exclusivity into the project. The great thing about not having exclusivity in that is that if Google either ceases to exist, which would be disaster for my book, or, uh, or Google um, changes its policy in a significant way, which is entirely possible. Um, if its you know, board of directors thinks that this project is actually too much of a legal liability, it could actually just abandon the project. If it were to abandon the project, then all of these universities would be free to move over to some other model, which may actually be the opening for my argument in a better way. Uh, which, by the way, I think is very likely to happen because Google is going to lose big in court over, this, uh, over these lawsuits with the publishers, and that's if they, if they get to court. Chances are they're gonna settle with the publishers and not even get to court, but that's another story. Yes? You talk about this a little bit in your talk about how fringe movements sort of, because they're very organized about this, uh, can get themselves sort of on the front page, but not just fringe like uh, movements that are religious or social, but also, Clearly, there's the people who do a lot of search engine optimization to try to force things down our throat. How do you think that's going to interact with, if we have some big mesh, if we have this fabric that occurs, there's going to be a lot of incentive on a number of different parts and organizations to influence the look of that fabric, and probably not for the better. Yeah. Okay, so there's search engine optimization, which is the action by users, search engine users, web <laughs> publishers, etc., to make sure that they're pages get high in the results, right? Now, one thing to remember is, on the opposite side, the search engine companies, and Google's not the only one that does this, uh, are doing search engine customization. They're tailoring results 
to where you are in the world, tailoring results based on your previous searches and clicks, uh, tailoring results based on uh, your sort of declared preferences in a variety of web searching activities. So you might get a completely different set of results sitting in this room uh, using an IP number assigned by uh, UNC than you would in your own apartment using an IP number assigned by your, uh, your internet service provider there. It's certainly different than if you're sitting in Chicago. Um, might be slightly different, but they are going to be different. Um, and, the, and, and so what you have then is an unstable ranking system. Now that can be very good from the commercial point of view, right? Because you actually do want, as a search engine company, you have incentive to customize searches for people's immediate needs. If you're looking for a shoe store, all the better to find one within 20 miles than find one within four states, right? It kind of makes sense. But when you're talking about books, you're not necessarily interested in the same level of customization. And if you are, we should at least have some sort of general understanding about how search engines are, are rigging the system to produce certain results. What you have currently with the Google Book Search system is a completely opaque uh, uh, search system, a completely opaque set of standards, to the point where um, you have no idea why one book is above another in the ranking. You can right now do a search for uh, any subject you know a lot about, and you might have in your mind three or four books that you think are central. The same three or four books you would recommend to someone who walked into a library and asked you, you know, what should I, if I want the three best books about chess, what are they? You might, if you know something about chess, you might have those three books in your head, and if you're a librarian who has some expertise in that area, it wouldn't be hard to figure out those three books. Well, there's no reason to think that Google's search engine is actually going to bring those three books anywhere near the front page. And I think uh, what I found in my own sort of digging around in this is that for things I know a lot about, often the search results are horrifying. Um, and that's largely because books don't work like web pages, right? They're not, they're not linked to each other. So you can't count incoming links and rank them based on that rough uh, uh, system. So something's going on there, but we don't know what it is. So if you were going to design a better system, you would have widely agreed upon standards. You would have a set of course searches that generally reflects the needs of whatever community you're serving. And of course, it would be customized to some degree, but it would be openly customized, right? It wouldn't be quite so opaque and quite so secret. It certainly wouldn't be a trade secret. Um, and that, I think, is a big difference. Ultimately, when you're dealing with a large collection, the easy part is the scanning. The hard part is the management. The hard part is creating that filter, as every search engine is a filter. Um, are you going to build a filter that serves the interest of the reading public in general? Are you going to build a set of filters that specifically serve particular parts of communities? Again, debates that people in this world should be having. We're kind of not, because we're just letting Google build it. And that's, I think, a big problem. Yes? Um, the title of your talk is the Human Knowledge Project, but it's not the past Human Knowledge Project. project. Right. And what's, what's breaking down for me is the Genome Project was discovering new things, making new information available, and who's going to control that. What we're really talking about is, depending on your resources, you pretty much have access to history, as long as you can get a plane ticket. Um, what do you propose for human knowledge from here forwards? so that I can have a free copy of your book if I'm in, in Africa. In yeah. Um, wow. I actually don't have an answer yet. Um, that is a, that's, that's really, yeah, that's big. Um, I should write another book just about that. <laughs> um, but, you know, I mean, look, it's not as if this, this model of, uh, of available digitized texts is frozen at, you know, February 2008, right? It does actually and would include everything published from now on, ideally. Uh, but again, those are the sorts of things you have to negotiate, the terms you have to negotiate, the ways you have to work through um, copyright restrictions globally, not just locally. Um, I mean, there are all sorts of reasons that as good, as, uh, as potentially good as the Google project is, it doesn't satisfy anything close to universality. It's nowhere close. We shouldn't even pretend that it is. Largely because um, it's designed to pass muster 
based on American copyright. So it doesn't even come close to passing muster based on Canadian copyright. Um, so it's not available in the same way as in Canada. Uh, so, you know, those are the sorts of things you need to work out to make sure that works of the future are easily accessible um, and financially viable. That's not an easy challenge either. But it is the sort of challenge that we do want to confront head on uh, and not just sort of hope that a savior comes in uh, to, uh, to deal with the situation for us. Shall we? Thank you. All right. Thanks very much for hanging out. Sorry. Sorry.